Good morning. Uh, I wish to thank the organizers for the privilege of uh, giving a lecture. And I'm happy the two previous speakers elucidated on quite a few issues already. I actually separated it into two lectures because, or two parts, because in my mind, hypoplasia has nothing to do with interrupted arch, but uh, so I, I just start with, uh, with the issue of the hyperplastic arch, and we heard about that. Victor was telling us about it. It's still in my mind, especially uh, since I prepared for this lecture, it's not clear what is really a hypoplastic arch. How do we tackle it? Uh, does the arch grow? And there's a number of publications out there. And we know, unfortunately, Bob Anderson is not here. I dug this paper out. The arch or the, the yeah, this continuity can have a, there's a wide spectrum. Uh, the, the head vessels can come off at different areas and the, the arch can be long and narrow and whatnot. We, we, we seem to get a, an idea from the, from the prenatal uh, diagnosticians that, that you can already get a feeling whether or not a arch is going to be hypoplastic prenatally, and I understand there's gonna be a lecture about that later on. But now, what do we as surgeons, or when we have these joint meetings, call a hypoplastic arch? And very often, we seem to refer to the first publication where we just very simply, we have the echo data or information, and we measure it out, and then we, we want to know how much does the kid weigh, and we add the odd one to it, um, which seems to be widely, widely used. And, and what is also being used at the lower panel, you see this publication, there was a <coughs> echocardiographic study from which it seems to be that uh, Z-score minds of two should lead us to be more aggressive in the operating room, which is either an extended anastomosis or treat the patient from the front. Now, what would you do? I could ask you now to raise your hands if, if this patient was presented to you in the joint session. And, and I'm, I'm sure without asking you now to do this very thing, that some surgeons or cardiologists in the room would, would tend to operate from the side and others would just ask the surgeon to operate from the front with, uh, on pump. And here the Z score, at least the computer uh, spat that number out, was minus three. So, so I guess in Munich we would probably come to the uh, agreement to operate this patient from the front, go on pump and patch the arch. Uh, I find this this way of measuring quite interesting. I, I stumbled across this paper when I prepared the lecture, and I'm not sure if it's widely, widely used. These uh, cardiologists um, reckon that, that it's probably helpful to, uh, to compare arch measurements to the, to the abdominal aorta. And I was wondering, I, I wanted to talk to, uh, to our cardiologist in Munich whether or not we should do this extra me measurement in the future and maybe, maybe compare the, the measurement we, we are doing, we usually do, and, and see whether, whether this decision tree makes sense or not, because it eventually led, led these uh, cardiologists to then embark either on a lateral or medium, medium uh, operation from the front. But I still don't know whether this is, makes sense or not. But what we do know, and there are many publications out there, I only brought you three or four, that the proximal arch and the distal arch does not seem to grow as much as we expect it to grow. This is a publication from the uh, Australian group. And they have, they have done a few studies over the years, and you see here a lot of patients enrolled. They divided it into certain e eras. They operated with patches extended end-to-end -end and whatnot. You heard about that. But Basically, and this was, this was for me the, the main message, that the 10-year freedom from reobstruction after end-to-side end uh, repair through stenotomy was more favorable than operating the patient through a lateral uh, torocotomy. And this Z-score of minus two seems to be the magic number. These are the same patients, uh, Victor, uh, presented more or less, there was uh, the Munich group quite a, quite a, uh, well used these, these uh, coarctation data and 
on the right hand side you see the smaller the child, the more hypoplastic the arch, the more likely the child is coming back and needing re-intervention or re-operation over time. And here's the last presentation from a group in, in, uh, in, uh, from England. They also had, again, different eras. And what I'm trying to get at, again, like I showed you before, I guess at the moment, and I understood Victor the same way, we are, we are more happy or find it easier to operate these patients with a very hypoplastic segment from a front. Also, the, the group from England, they were, since 2000, they were more and more aggressive when they had patients with a hypoplastic arch segment. And, and you see decade one, decade two, decade two is the one after 2000. Uh, freedom from reoperation, from reintervention is much more favorable. And again, if you do it from the front, you seem to have much better mid and probably long-term results. So to conclude, my, my first topic I was meant to talk about, hyperplastic arch. I think diagnosis requires an in-detail assessment of the entire aorta, how to measure, maybe, maybe you can elucidate to me again what you thought about this uh, comparison with the, dis with the abdominal aorta. There are a number of uh, operative approaches and there still does not seem to be a true consensus on when to do what. However, with the growing experience f uh, of the Norwood operation, many centers, including ours, uh, favor a midline approach and patching uh, of the aorta. Now I move on to interrupted aortic arch. And for the interest of time, I will not be able to, talk, to elucidate all the issues. In the European data bank, I found more than 500 patients. Um, early mortality of those 500 patients lingers around 10%. Now, from this database, you can pick out the five best hospitals, usually hospitals which do more than 20 cases a year, which are, there are not many. Some have apparently no early mortality. Uh, we do have, at the moment, an early mortality of 6%. This is very hot data. We haven't published it yet. We have a follow-up completeness of uh, 96%, 149 patients. And you see, the point I want to make here is early survival, I think, talking about interrupted aortic arch and also many other complex lesions is not an issue, at least in Germany or Western Europe anymore. So early mortality is rather low. However, and we have found that already in 2000, where we had 94 patients, is still an issue we seem to have with left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and arch. And that is those two issues I want to elucidate a bit more. I think this slide shows the dilemma we are stuck in. We started to operate, or the hospital was opened in 1974, and since then, even though we are a high volume center with nearly 500 cases a year, even we only see two to eight patients per year with this rare lesion, which is not a lot, which means that both cardiologists and surgeons are not really doing this often, and uh, it's always a challenge. But the story continues. There's a, there are a lot of re-interventions or re-operations necessary, and I found that quite disturbing, to say the least, when, when, when we found that. And many patients have two, three, four, or even more re-interventions or re-operations over time. And again, I mainly want to focus now on aortic arch issues and left ventricular outflow tract issues because th those are the uh, complications which happen most over time. I'm not going to talk about operative strategy, single or two-stage repair. I guess we all understand that single-stage correction is the way to go. Uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, how to cannulate and uh, whether to cool down or not. I basically want to concentrate uh, in the interest of time just on these two issues, outflow tract relief 
and Arch. And this story also tells it from our patients. It's not always straightforward. If you have a minute or tiny aortic valve or a uh, very small alveolar tract, you, you might have to go the univentric univentricular pathway. Uh, and there are other operations you can offer those patients. But I think this, this slide quite nicely shows that what a challenge it is for you uh, diagnostic people and us to decide which is the best treatment arm for that very patient. This alpha tract obstruction, and we had a lecture yesterday, that is not that difficult to tackle, I think. Uh, as long as the aortic valve is, or the annulus, is big enough, because you can, as I will show you, this is a publication from Ed Beauvais, uh, usually as a surgeon, you can, uh, you, you can cut that muscle shelf either away or incise it, you can enlarge the VSD, patch it, uh, or you can use other tricks to at least for a while relieve a quite narrow looking LVOT and then with the hope or intention that the aortic valve, which is often bicuspid, will grow. And if you have done a good job, if you were lucky, you get that at least discharge echo, we show you that. However, we know, and we have shown you from our data over time, 30-year follow-up, that even if you have managed such an, an ideal result, some patients will come back for a residual or reoccurring outflow tract issue. Now, if you have, I quite like that publication because they, um, an American group, they looked into critical left outflow tract obstructions and try to elucidate whether or not, or what were the predictors to either embark on a univentricular pathway or biventricular repair. And I mean, I've never put that data into that uh, score calculator, but uh, they have done that on a huge cohort in trying to define uh, which would be the best route for a patient. And also what is quite disturbing, if you get it wrong, if you squeeze a patient who has a very small aortic valve with a minute left ventricular outflow tract, maybe with smallish LV structures into a biventricular pathway, you might end up with multiple reoperations. And you see survival of univentricular palliative patients managed discordantly compared to predicted survival where it's worse. And the same goes here for biventricular repair. So you must hopefully get it right from the very start when you diagnose a patient whether or not he should have two ventricles or one for a start. You, you, you can uh, use the Norwood operation for, if you see on the very left, very small aortic valves. You can do that, do a Norwood operation, eventually uh, go for a Ross Condor later on, complex surgery, probably quite a few operations uh, during lifetime. However, hopefully one, one gets it right at the very beginning diagnosing a patient, which is the best uh, way to move forward. And I, that's a summary from this paper, and I quite like that the intuitive notion that two ventricles are better than one exists. However, a discordant biventricular repair is more costly in survival terms than a discordant univentricular palliation. I like that. And that com coming back to the slide I showed you already, I find that quite disturbing. Apart from we know that they have genetic abnormalities and whatnot, many patients will come back several times over the years. And you saw, we even had the odd patient who came back the sixth time in Munich. Whether or not we did it right at the first time, we, we will look into the data now uh, even more. But we, we, we know, and from other groups with a long follow-up, we know that these patients um, are very prone to, uh, to come back to your attention. Arch repair, my last topic. Ideally, you can mobilize, we showed it, we've seen it from Victor, and you do a direct anastomosis. But you can not always, at least in, that's my understanding, from my experience, you, you cannot always achieve that. And to get you really confused now, I just brought two or three publications. 
you can use the left subclavian artery, flap it down. You can use the carotid artery and flap it over and back and forth. Thousands of tricks around. You can use a prosthetic material. You can uh, swing it around, make an extensive, uh, extended anastomosis. So again, like in the previous talk, there are probably 15 techniques out there. I want to show you our most recent technique, which, I've, uh, which I quite like. You see a very small aorta. However, we were able to correct the patient because we measured the aortic valve in the operating room. That is, I'm picking up with my forceps, the ascending aorta. We go on bypass, we cool the patient right down. And then you see the huge, uh, you see the left subclavian artery here, which is freed. Eventually it's, it's, gonna, it's going to be clipped. You will see that in a second here, a clip. And then we swing it up and we, uh, like in a Norwood operation, we create a, there's a, uh, the, the posterior wall of this arch is native tissue, hopefully growing. And then in the, in the proximal aspect, the forceps is going right down in the descending aorta. We patch it like in a Norwood operation. So the idea is uh, if, if the distance is too wide to have at least a, uh, a short uh, material tissue which is native in the back, hopefully allowing the arch to grow. And to conclude this as well, I, th I think an adequate preoperative workup together with interoperative judgment and institutional experience is required to distinguish ideal candidates for bi biventricular repair and uh, clinical predictors of published data are still are controversial, at least that's what I understood from uh, digging through the literature. Light ventric left ventricular outflow tract and arch stenosis are the main reasons for reinterventions. And even we saw that even successful repair may lead to significant pre post-operative sequelae during follow-up. Thank you very much.